So I know, I know you were at some sort of sci-fi convention yesterday. W w tell me about those conventions. What do you have to do? Well, you know, uh, I'm a sort of uh, I'm a sort of god in the in the science fantasy world, and uh, and the, my fans uh, have become sort of pilgrims. Uh, and they don't go to Lourdes or Mecca or Medina or whatever. They come to, say, Camba Sands to uh, Pontins, <laughs> where I arrive and they, they handle me and worship me. And, uh, and I congratulate them on their taste and I sign autographs very affectionately. And there's a quite a lot of physicality, you know, a lot of, a lot of kissing and hugging goes on. Um, and they have their photographs taken with me and they just adore me, really. And I... I can't complain, you know, because I always wanted to be loved, really. Uh, and then, as I got more confident, I wanted to be adored. And now, in the twilight of my life, I have to tell you the good news, and now I'm, well, worshipped, really. <laughs> <laughs> but you go all over the world doing it. Do you have to, do you have to, is it a bit, do you have to dress up? Do you have to put the hat and the scarf on and be Doctor Who? No, I, no, 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 because that's all in their head, you know, they, they, you see, fan love is infinitely superior to human beings' love, because fans, uh, they don't say, oh, God, he, you know, he, he's, he's gone bald, or he's fat, or he's old, because it must be something to do with, you'd know this better than I do, that the, that no, the power of nostalgia actually is, the, is a trigger from a tune, or a smell, or a sight of an old Doctor Who, that catapults you back to when you were young and full of hope, uh, and happy, you know, and and thinking, and so when someone actually reminds you of that, you're very vulnerable, and we're all like that, aren't we? I mean, if someone to meet, uh, you know, a great football player, a great cricket player, a great singer, uh, does that to us, doesn't it? When we meet them old, we jump back, and uh, we love them for that pleasure they give us. It's the miracle. Uh, you even can an old lover can do that. Even you can do this all over the world, though, can't you? I mean, you can go to... I mean, how many countries... I don't know how many countries Doctor Who's been shown in. 68. 68. Yeah. It was very interesting to go to a foreign country and be famous as you got off the plane. And indeed, you know, to have a certain... Uh, rub I air hostesses used to rub against me, you know? Um, it, yeah. But you don't have to do anything when you get... They don't expect the speech about science fiction or you... You stand there and they take pictures of you and you sign autographs or they want to kiss you or... Yeah, they want to kiss... They mostly want to kiss me, yes, uh, and, and to handle me. Yeah, and, and also they tremble a lot, uh, the way one does with a god, I suppose. It's a long time since I tremble, but I used to tremble at, in front of the, the tabernacle when I was young in Liverpool, you know, because, I mean, at one time I was a fan of God. I mean, I was devoted to him, you know, with his incredible... Uh, of course, I've forgiven him now. Now that I've discovered he doesn't exist, it's a bit late. But you see, I can, we we can say this, this. We both went to the same drama school, and I thought, well, what I wanted to be most in the world was a very, was to be a famous actor. And then I sort of like watched as you became indeed a very, very famous actor and couldn't walk anywhere without being recognised. Now I know the money must have been marvellous, or still is marvellous. But that business of being recognised so repeatedly, how, how, how do you deal with it? How, how do you manage it? How do you control it? I mean, people have got phones, they've got, they've, got, they've got cameras on their phones now. Wherever you go, they must be taking pictures of you. Well, they are. When I, when I go to talk, I do actually talk uh, or, or answer questions for an hour. And now it's not like being at a fascist rally, you know, because, of course, there was a time when they just listened in amazement. But now they've all got their phones up in the air, well, well, so I, I have to be a little bit more careful. But being recognised, you know, the impulse to be an actor and being recognised, you know, is success, isn't it? I mean, and it happened, you know, right through. It wasn't just uh, one class or one type of person. I remember one time in Sloan Square where I used to cruise at the height of my fame there and cruise pretty successfully. Anyway, I was outside Peter Jones, which was a good place to cruise, and... Uh, a little old lady, who had been a b great beauty in her time, said, Hello, dear. And I was used to this. I said, Hello. And she said, Oh. And she clutched her bosom rather operatically and said, I, I'm so sorry. Do I know you or, or am I going dotty? And I said, Gently. I said, Perhaps you've got grandchildren. Oh, yes. She said, You're the man from Doctor Who. Good God. She said, Yes. As soon as I saw you, I knew you were special because my titties began to tingle. <laughs> and I, I thought... <laughs> 
Isn't that marvellous? You know, my mother, who was a lovely, a wonderful, could never have said a phrase like that. And I, I thought perhaps on my gravestone, here lies Tom Baker, who made titties tingle. <laughs> About sums up the silliness of, you know, of telly fame, isn't it? But we... Because I say we're allowed just to talk a bit about the time we were together at this drama school. And, and, and then when I was there with you, I thought we rather... We, although we wanted to be famous, I have no doubt we wanted to be famous, but we did really rather despise actors, didn't we? I mean, you've lived your life among actors. Did you come to love them? Oh, no, no. I mean, of course, <coughs> no, I think actors absolutely hate each other. Uh, but then I think that vets hate each other, you know, and uh, chiropodists hate each other, and they'll never. And scientists and professors hate each other. Of course, you can't actually name your hatred because you never know when you might be in a play with him. <coughs> but I think I would quite like, before I die, if I have the chance, I wouldn't mind making a tape, uh, and it would be a long list of all the people I've worked with and taken orders from, you know, who really for years and I despise myself for it. I've thought of us tossers, you know, but you have to do it. You know, one of your, you know, why actors are, uh, with any spirit, are uh, often anxious is that from the very beginning, you're kicked around, you know, unless you're a very, very big, powerful actor, but most of us are told what to do, what the play means, by people we despise, you know, called directors, and they say, this is a play about eyes. And you say, oh, really? Uh, you know, they're talking about the white devil or something like that, you know. And, and I said, well, how... Wh I, there's a great line in the white devil. I said, uh, when the man says to the Duke of Florence, he says, he, about a doctor, Julio, who was a murderer, he once bottled a fart that poisoned the whole of Dublin. <laughs> so would you say, I said to Roland Joffe, it was, who became a famous film director, I think, I said, would you say that was more about noses than eyes? That was Tommy said, don't be smart, you know. Next. <laughs> so uh, all the time you have to suppress, you have to work with people you don't like and sometimes despise. But that must apply to everything, doesn't it? But you see, most people would talk to you, uh, and I'm sure many people start by talking to you entirely about Doctor Who, but you've, uh, you've done uh, an awful lot of acting. I've seen you in many parts. I thought that your performance in Educating Rita was quite, was quite wonderful, quite marvellous, so much better than Michael Caine. And I uh, enjoyed that, and I also saw your Wild, and uh, of course there's the film with the Rasputin and all this. Uh, does, do, you, do you feel a little bit that because you've been on the telly and done Doctor Who that nobody remembers any of those other parts that you played and do, don't characterise you as an actor but think of you more as a performer on the television? Well, <coughs> I th no, I don't think that at all. I think that I was grateful to become Doctor Who and realise, you know, that uh, in fact it wasn't an acting part the way those heroes are not acting parts because they're predictable. That's the wonderful and difficult thing about playing a hero. Within predictability, how can you be surprising and amusing, you know? And when I got to Doctor Who, uh, and then, no one was telling me what to do anymore, you know? Uh, because th the audience figures spoke for themselves. Um, and so then, people were consulting me about things, you know? And I went on Woman's Hour, uh, and people were asking my opinion, as if I had any opinions worth listening to, you know? And I found that quite funny and enjoyed that, really. No, I was very happy to have become Doctor Who. Uh, and I finished 30 odd years ago, and yet yesterday I was blessing the fans who've grown old and bald and stooped with me and who go on loving me, you know. Uh, that's quite something, really. But don't you ever want to say, didn't you ever see me in Educating Rita? I mean, when people, you know, when your obituary is produced, do you, wouldn't you like to be credited as, as a good actor elsewhere rather than simply in Doctor Who? No. I don't think so, because I don't really rate my acting, but my Doctor Who was entirely Tom. It was just Tom. I wasn't acting, and it just fell into my lap, you know, and they said, how are you going to do it? And I said, I don't know. And I started saying the lines, and the, and the children loved it, you know, and I thought, hey, so who wants to act? I can be Tom. They're loving Tom, you know, <laughs> and I like that. Because we I should remember the moment when you got the job, because... Uh, just go back to the, to the actual... What were you doing immediately before... You went for an audition. How, and how on earth did you get an audition for such well, a big... I, I wrote to someone I, who had wa I'd once worked for, and he had been at a casting session for Doctor Who because the other man had resigned. And they said, Bill, have you got any views? He was becoming the head of the department. He didn't have any views. And that night, he got a letter. For, he, 
the last letter he picked up was from me. And uh, there was a little film called The Golden Voyage of Sinbad on, right next door to the BBC in Shepherd's Bush Green. And when he went to the next one the next day, he said, what about Tom Baker? And they said, we've never heard of him. He said, well, he's on in a movie next door. And they all piled off to the movie right next door, 50 yards away. And they said, yeah, that's the man. It was amazing, eh? Absolutely amazing. And suddenly, I was struggling and short of money and living on somebody's floor who was very kind to me. And then suddenly, in a split second, I was a sex symbol. You know, people f to be found desirable, to be desired, Laurie. Well, you know, we know, we've had our moments. But to be desired is a fantastic sensation, I think. But when did the, the idea that you would end up at drama college was a bit strange? In the first place, it was almost... Why, what was it that made you decide that you wanted to be an actor? Because looking at your background, what you were doing in Liverpool, that time in the Merchant Navy, the time in the monastery, there was nothing there which suggested that you might want to become an actor. <coughs> no, but when I was in the army, uh, there wasn't all that much action. I was in the medical corps, so I, so my superior officers were all quite young doctors, and we did a lot to entertain each other, you know. And so I, I got caught, I got drawn into these entertainments, uh, and especially wearing women's clothes, which I quite liked, which is probably w what I liked about being a Roman Catholic. I just wanted to get dressed up in women's clothes that, that rustled, you know. Was, uh, oh. Anyway, I did a very good impersonation of the matron. In fact, it was so, people were terrified it was so exact. And somebody said to me, the way people do, you know, hey, Tom, said this kind doctor, you know, you should go to the RADA and, and become an actor. Um, because they were all laughing at my performance, you know, and, uh, and that's how it started, really. I mean, I, I, I can't say I was playing with little Pollock model theatres, you know, putting on plays with the children in the alleyway. It wasn't like that at all. But it was quite a class translation as well, wasn't it? Because you... Coming from working class Liverpool, I mean, did somebody say this is how you do an audition, or I mean, how did you, you got you got into the Rose Bruford? You must have done an audition. Yeah, I did. It. I did an audition, and uh, but I mean, they, you know, f people like us who'd been in the army, and I'd been in the navy, and I told them I think that I'd been in the Foreign Legion. That was a lie, but they swallowed it. They could. They what did they know? Um, and I told them I'd been on suicide missions and things like that, and they said really, and their dentures clicked. And I thought, you know, I can manipulate this lot. Uh, and it was quite nice, you know, we spent our lives manipulating people, but it was quite nice manipulating people who are quite powerful, you know. I mean, actually, I suppose, really, the joy of seduction is the manipulation, isn't it, really? And th they didn't know what we were talking about, did they? And they didn't, they hadn't read any plays. You know, you'd been in plays by Max Frisius on Amateur, while uh, uh, Rose Bruford, they were doing I Kill the Count, you know, or Black Coffee. <laughs> they were hopeless. Did you learn anything at that college? No, I, I, I picked up... I. You know, I learned that if I was nice to girls and uh, and did my best at the ballet dancing, um, that uh, they liked me a lot, you know. And, of course, naturally, one takes advantage of people who like one, I think. You still do say in your, in your very, very funny autobiography, you talk about, I think, something about... Uh, the time in the monastery, in a way, inclining you towards acting as well. Was that was there something about you, uh, the, 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 that you went there? You went, you went there, I think you say in your book, to lose your sense of self, really, yes. to, 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 to prostrate yourself yes. before, before God, in a way. I mean, I, I, although I've read about your time there, I'm still never quite certain why you went there and how long you were there and what, what a strange life it was for you to live there. Well, you see... Uh, at the Liverpool of that time, you know, the only way out for, a, for, a, for an ordinary working-class boy was through school, with a grammar school and then perhaps university or something like that. I, w I was very impressionable and not very good. Uh, there was a lot of missing of school, so I didn't get into the grammar school or anything like that because of the war. Uh, and the other thing is, I was very vulnerable, you know, when people were always telling me. I was brought up in a, very, in a, in a crisis time of deep faith. And deep faith makes people very, very uh, strange, I think. It makes them passionate about very ordinary things. So I remember, for example, a verbal felicity, dare on say, of my mother, who would say things like, um, <coughs> put the kettle on, Louis, uh, and in five minutes, if God spares us, I'll make the tea. As if somehow death was imminent, you know, between actually putting the kettle on and making the tea. And so when Mr. Hart, the headmaster, was telling us, remember, Baker, you are nothing, you are nothing, 
you know, I didn't have all that much confidence. I thought, well, I'm nothing, you know. And so, and then it was going to the idea of abasement, the idea of being nothing, the idea of confessing uh, intimate things, you know. And then, of course, at the age of, uh, you know, 10 or 11 or something, when I discovered what it was to have a throbber on. So when you went to confess it, and the priest, I've done an impure act, and the priest, who would be smoking two caps in full strength at the same time, would get closer when he'd heard that, and his beads would rattle, and his voice would become hoarse, and he'd always say, Did pollution take place? I thought, I said, uh, I, I, said uh, I was a bit baffled by that. Did pollution take, marvelous word. He said, Did you take pleasure? I said, oh, Yes, yes, I did, I did. And then I couldn't stop him. It's, of course, a terrible crisis. Because, you know, we were frightened of being run over, mortal sin. And the idea of, of, uh, of these ej ejaculations, which used to be, I mean, a prayer, an ejaculation to God, as opposed to an ejaculation of one's seed. Um, the thing is, you know, that it, there, were uh, there are millions and millions. You should have asked Richard Dawkins about this, about how many spermatozoa there are. But it wasn't just a mortal sin. I mean, when you spilled your seed, it was genocide. So... You were killing babies. Well, we were killing babies, and they're millions. Uh, and so the thing is that, you know, when you're absolutely packed with seed, and we were sp I, I was doing genocide sometimes three times a day, you know, which was a hard, a very hard burden on an 11-year-old You see, old people boy. forget today, don't they, how all-encompassing Catholicism was at that time and how it shifted now. You can meet Catholics now and nothing about them speaks of repression or inhibition or concern yeah. at all. It, it all seems to have gone. Yeah, I believe so. I believe they backtracked on all that kind of thing. But it was, a very, it was so cruel at uh, telling us that we were nothing. And now, apparently, they, well, they've ditched pur purgatory, haven't they, and limbo and uh, hell. And there's hardly any confession. Well, no. I, I said to a priest the other day I, I, I met, and I said from a distance, because going near them fills me with revulsion, um, I, uh, I said to him, do you actually believe in the resurrection of the body? And I must say, to, to give him credit, he kind of looked around like old comics used to do, and he said, uh, <coughs> well, Tom, he said, I think the jury's still out on that. <laughs> 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 you bet it's still out. Yeah. Uh, now, what, what about, uh, I was going to ask you about, so, so we talked about that monastery, which was the idea of getting rid of uh, the self. How long were you there? Uh, well, nearly six years. Nearly six, six years. years. By that time, of course, I had made the leap from a genocide, you know, to chastity and embraced the, the suffering that that brings. Uh, and really embraced the whole idea. You know, it was an alternative. It was an alternative existence, wasn't it? You see, there in the monastery, you didn't need to be clever. All you needed is, uh, is to actually be abject, to have no views at all. And that wonderful trick, you know, they say, listen, when your superiors give you an order, it is God speaking. So no matter how stupid it is, how patently, patently stupid it is, God is testing you. Now, that's a marvellous alibi, isn't it, for treating people badly, you know. We weren't, of course, allowed. When I was a young, when my novitiate, we weren't even allowed to look at each other. And so, when we were in the chapel, the only sight you had of anyone was the curves in the back of their neck. I remember a very pretty boy in front of me called Olivier Jean. And uh, I used to have this terrific desire, you know, to stroke the back of his neck. I didn't know what the front of his head looked like because we weren't allowed to look at him, you know. And we were all ejaculating in the, in the religious sense all day long. People were crying out, blurting out things like, God be praised, you know. Or think of St. Stanislaus. That was a good one, yes. Um, and so sometimes I'd say, you know, think of St. Wilberforce or something like that. They didn't seem to notice that either. When you think now, can you, can you imagine the sort of self that you had that believed all that? Because also when you look back, you were talking about your mother. I mean, she believed it absolutely, didn't she? Right the way through to the end of her life. It yes. informed her existence. Yes. In My life. wonderful mother said an extraordinary thing that I can recall quite clearly that I overheard as a child talking to her sister. She said, you know, Louis, thank God we're poor. And Louis said, how do you mean, Jane? She said, well, Father Sharkey had been in, and he was saying, blessed are the poor, for they shall see God, Mrs. Baker. And that consoled my mother, you know, it's absolutely wonderful. It's the great paradoxes of Christianity, you know, that's all I know about, the marvelous paradoxes. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And as Mark Twain said, yeah, and it'll be interesting to see how long they hold on to it. Uh, 
it's all uh, so it's a way of making poor ignorant people cope with their misery isn't it and then to be giving two shillings a week to the church amounted in my view when I look back on it to protection money a man in black used to knock at the door and my mother would reach by the clock where there'd be a two shilling piece to pay off the priest who knew how poor we were you know but this man could forgive our sins so so we were, so my whole in the tumult of my imagination, death was very imminent all the time. I was nothing. I was abject. And that the end of the world was a desirable state and heaven existed. And then, of course, was the absence of privacy. Because if you're a, if you're a Christian, there's no such thing as privacy since God is everywhere. So, and, and then you've got your guardian angel on your left shoulder. So, I mean, you know, going for a good, stiff, Rabelaisian bowel movement made you very, very tense because there were two big important people there. You couldn't see them, but you believed in them. Uh, when I was a novice in my monastery, I mean, we all put on linen gowns in order to have communal showers. And of course, as you can imagine, with the water coming from the ceiling and the side like that hot water and some sweaty old monk there scalding the young men that we were or, or freezing us at his pleasure, but you know the bodies of young men in linen in linen shifts probably look quite good to certain repressed people. I mean, because you you feel you feel quite ag I think you feel quite aggressive now towards religion, don't you? Yeah, I, mean, I do. You know, because Very. For, perhaps for what it did to your to, to your mother, or perhaps to, 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 to all the people who bought into it. Well, that, 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 that we swallowed all that guff, you know. Which finally, a lot of it has been ditched. Apparently, I don't know. But you know, when I uh, when I watch all those cardinals all dressed up and think that I want to put frocks on like that, and uh, why doesn't someone notice that the Pope looks like Uncle Fester, you know? And uh, this this whole idea, this and so bo you see, I prefer the American system at least. You know, I mean, most of what I look at television is only so that I can jeer and mock at it and shout and annoy my wife about it, who's a, a wonderful woman and puts up with me. But um, you know they would talk all the time as if they knew things and we know that they don't know things they don't know anything and so when uh, but at least in america it's very theatrical uh and you buy into this confidence trick you know the more eloquent they are uh you buy into it but we don't have that do we i mean religion on english television or on the radio oh i think they said dear god oh, <laughs> terrible you said before that I think you, you said something about not being. Did you say not much of an actor or something like that? I, I mean, it was a, a, an odd, an odd expression, as though you, as, as though you were critical of yourself when well, you were. An actor. I don't know. I've been critical of myself. The thing is, I've always been some sort of a performer, which led me to be an altar boy, you know, and uh, and and carry crosses and dress up in funny things. And of course, I love the thick stupefying smell of incense you know i mean i was high on incense if one can be inhaling incense you know and uh, and going to funerals and then realizing quite by accident i used to sometimes go to three funerals a day you know i mean life was much more interesting and passionate in the days before penicillin you know one good dose of uh of flu would see all the old women off in the street you know a nail in your shoe on a saturday night dance you'd be dead by the following thursday except to see me a big leg uh, and so I used to go to a lot of funerals, and I liked going to funerals. But I was somewhat thoughtable, so at least I could sniff the incense. Anyway, one day when I'd been to three funerals and was very hungry because you couldn't go to, you couldn't eat before you went to the mass. I must have been weeping with the cold. It was terrible, absolutely terrible. And at the end of the of the uh, of this little burial, a man took my hand, which rather scared me a bit and slipped into my hand a warm coin. When I got back into the sacristy, I realized it was a two shilling piece or a half crown or something. And it, I was corrupted instantly when I realized he thought that I was weeping because I was sorry, you know, that his mother had died or something. And he, being sentimental, gave me the money. And when I realized that, and the other tossers, these other boys, you know, probably went to grammar school for, I know, they were doing it absolutely straight while I was sobbing like a good one, you know, and they were getting threepenny bits while I was getting half crowns. So it was a kind of power, you know, I was just a performer, really. Um, but sometimes is it because you are, I mean, you're a very, you're a very literate person, you know, you, you, you read a lot, you, I mean, you love American novelists, whether it's Bellow or Roth or Updike, and you 
constant. I mean, is there a, is there a sense in which you you perhaps could, I mean you could have been a writer? I mean, I've said your autobiography is brilliantly written. It's a, it's a, such a readable piece. But you, you've not thought about writing. I mean, presumably on Doctor Who, you were often writing your own lines. It sounded as though you were writing your own lines. Yeah. <coughs> yes, I would. I mean, I did write a, a, a book about an evil boy called A Boy Who Kicked Pigs. That, yes. Which sells very well in Golders Green. But, uh, and that was a, a really a villain's book. And it's, uh, it's several people have tried to turn it into a, into a script. Um, I, do you know, I think actually, I, have, I do have a kind of uh, <laughs> slickness about being silly. But when I compare the people who move me deeply, like a modern novelist like, I mean, you, know, you remember the, the thrill when a new novel like Herzog would come out or, or Humboldt's Gift, and we would worship. Uh, uh, Saul Bellow, uh, but I think, uh, um, and John Updike, oh, a great man, great man, but Philip Roth for us, surely, you know, that, that stream of, of bestsellers, of uh, American pastoral, you know, I Married a Communist, Sabbath Theatre, that wonderful power and fearlessness as he creates characters and situations, raises him almost a godlike status, you know, I love everything he writes, even these small ones that are coming out now to get hammered. I'm not as brave as that, you know, to, uh... Finally, you see, like a waiter that I am, really, I'm a professional pleaser. I don't really like offending people because it's pitiful, really. I want to be loved, you know? Uh, and I suppose why I go 30 years onwards going through the Doctor Who routine is that that's, that worship and that love is available, you know? And, and I take it, and I take it to be... But you like that, you like power and force and energy of, well, you were talking about people like Roth, but I'm also, I mean, I think you've mentioned in the past, people like Christopher Hitchens, those sort of people who are rumbustuous and almost enter the fray. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I adore, I adore Hitchens' aggression, his barefaced, brutal aggression about, you know, being, uh, you know, uh, a crusading uh, atheist. I love it the way he doesn't seem to care, does he? That quality of not caring when it's coupled with such eloquence really thrills me. That quality, you know, I used to kick around in Soho in the days, of the, in my salad days of all that money and all that thing, kicking around, to be seen with, uh, with Francis Bacon, who didn't care about anything. You know, of course life had no meaning at all. I, 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 when I was drunk with him, I got on well with him because someone was giving him a terrible bollocking about his obscene paintings. And to defend him, I said, well, I think they're rather pretty. And Francis uh, found this convulsively funny, and uh, and it took me into his little coterie. And, and, and wonderful ne'er-do-wells like Jeff Barnard and people like that, you know, I, they thrilled me. I, I just, I, I just... Because they just, were living on the edge a bit, they were... Well, they, yeah, and they didn't care, you know, and people would say... Some people would come into coach and horses and say, Francis is on the piss. And there'd be a frisson in that corner, you know? Because, first of all, the ne'er-do-wells knew perfectly well Francis picked up all the bills. He used to carry a lavatory roll of 50s, you know? Uh, and he was extremely generous and amusing. Uh, and, you know, and Jeff Bernard, I was with Jeff Bernard when he w had pancreatitis, and doctor said, and he was in a terrible state of illness, and the doctor said, a nice doctor of the middle sex said, Jeff, could you knock off the vodka? And Jeff's eyes filled with tears, you know, as if someone said, will you betray your country? Oh, no, Christ, he said, no, I couldn't give up the vodka. And the doctor said, well, maybe you could cut it down a bit, Jeff. And Jeff's eyes then filled utterly with tears, and he said, No. I've been with Sally Smirnoff too long to give her the elbow now. Oh. <laughs> and Sally Smirnoff, who'd killed his dick, you know, who was killing him, had become the great substitute. It was an incredible transference of affection that finally the pain of deprivation, the pain of doing without Sally, outweighed his fear of death, you know. And I liked that. I thought that was eloquent. But you, you've lived that. I mean, you, 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 you always strike people as you know, as forceful, as strong, and as dominant. And you know, a lot of that comes back to your to your voice because you do. You, you, you know, in a way, how much your living has depended upon your voice. And I'm never quite sure where that voice came from. Uh, I mean, I, I come from Liverpool, but because I was lower middle class, we always were told not to say grass and to say grass. But, I mean, you had none of that. And this this is a voice which comes from you, but yet it's 
what you think about your own voice, you regard it, you hear it. I mean, yeah, it is one of the be, most uh, well-known voices in the whole of the country for yeah. commercials or for yeah. Little Britain. Yes. Uh, yeah. And the amazing thing, it's quite shameless of me, really, because I have a capacity, you know, to be absolutely sincere about things I don't believe in, uh, which I guess is the, uh, you know, is the kind of trick of the performer, isn't it, you know? Uh, I don't know. The commercials, because you've, ma you've made a great deal of money have, out of commercials, haven't you? I have you? done thousands of them, yeah. Actually, that's changed. You know, I used to do commercials about engagement rings and uh, lingerie and things like that, which I used to very talk very softly and beds and things like that. But now, as I've grown older, my voice is really cracked now. Maybe I'm better known or people employ me because of my coarseness in the studios. Um, but now I do second-hand cars, you know, in, in East Yorkshire. <laughs> and things like that, but I do still do uh, dramas, uh, BBC recordings. That but I hear, I hear commercials, and somebody says, "Oh, that's Tom, isn't it?" And I say, "No, no, that's a Tom impersonator, yeah, yeah, because right. your voice is so well known that th th there are, as it were, sub Toms. Yes, who there come are, in. Yes, there aren't there? You must yeah, be aware of that." Yeah, people say that's right. People say that. Uh, they can do a Tom Baker or whatever. Well, that's fair enough. You know, they get on the. I mean, you know, in a way, you know, a rather abject bloody uh, career as being an impressionist, isn't it? You know, and they always seem so fantastically dated. You know, when people actually, fellow said, have you seen his impression of of uh, John Wayne? And you say John Wayne, but I said, yeah. I mean, oh, oh, I saw Christopher Benjamin do a fantastic impression of Julius Caesar, and you think. God, what's the world coming to, you know? But somehow we respond to that, don't we? People doing impressions. Uh, you used to do a very good impression of Malcolm Muggeridge. <laughs> and now people would say Malcolm <laughs> Moore. <laughs> it's like know. John Wayne, really. It's but even but worse than it, John. But he was a great entertainer in his day, wasn't he? And to do that. But I've heard you. You, 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 you also have... I've, I've, I've heard a recording, it must have been some sort of little bootleg thing, of you in a commercial getting more and more angry at what you have to put up with. I mean, I think, I think many people quite know what you have to do when you're doing a voiceover. I mean, it's an, it, it can be quite absurd, can't it, the way you've got to repeat this daft slogan and message over and over again. Yeah, well, I think that's true, you know, when they, when they don't always know what they want. But however, if someone hires me, they know what they're going to get. You know, they're going to get enthusiastic bad taste. And of course, that was reinforced by Little Britain, you know, and marvellous lines. Uh, some, I actually suggested one they wouldn't use because even in Little Britain they had one. But I was trying to make you laugh about that wonderful line in the side of Little Britain, you know. Yes, and then we come to fat people. Now, what do fat people do in the summer? I'll tell you what they do. They smell. That's what they do. Now, when, when, I, or if, when, I, was, when I do these conferences, you know, I used to say, and so I'd have to say sincerely, and so we're saying goodbye to Gary Mitchell, uh, our fire line director, and we wish him well in the future. He's been great to be with. That was the way it was written, you know. After Little Britain, I was entitled to say, and so uh, we've got to say now goodbye to, to Gary, you know, our finance director. Christ, he was a good boy to go cruising with. Oh, oh, <laughs> blimey, I've come all over jism. Uh, no, that would have got me the sack before Little Britain. After Little Britain, I had the imprimatur to be in bad taste with people who were afraid of it, you know, because no one wants to concede he's got no sense of humour. And so Gary would say, what did he say about going cruising? They say, it's a joke. Oh, he said, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, Tom was great to go cruising with as well. So, you know, you go along with the, what they want, really. But that was, uh, I mean, that, I mean that, those commercials. How did Little Britain come along? Because there's, there seemed to be a problem. Did, did, by the way, did you give up? I, can't, I can never remember whether you gave up Doctor Who or just you, you got sick of yes, it. Yes, I did. I, I, I gave up after a while because... Uh, I got fed up with the new producers and the way it was going. But Little Britain happened. You see, now I'm mostly employed by the children who watched me as, uh, as Doctor Who. And so Matt Lucas and David Williams loved me when they were children, you see. And so when they were on the radio uh, writing Little Britain and they needed this kind of silly man who was obviously so thick and so reactionary that uh, he was funny, that was it. Uh, it was a good idea. And so they said, let's get Tom. And so they invited me along, you know, and there were these two young men, and, uh, and they said how much they'd watched me as Doctor Who. And so now I'm mostly employed by people who watched me as Doctor Who, you know, and that's interesting, isn't and it? the impact that you had uh, upon children, upon all that business, the, the hiding behind the sofa. There's a lovely story that you tell in the book about, uh, who, who I often wonder what ever happened to this child when he or she was it grew up. I think you were coming down the motorway or you were coming to London and suddenly realised that an episode 
of Doctor Who that you particularly wanted to see was on, uh, but you weren't going right. to arrive home in time to see it? Well, I could go. In those days, it was amazing how it's changed in a relatively short space of time. I had access to wherever there were children, you know. I have seen thousands of pictures of children on my knee and are now brought by people who've grown up, and they say, that's me on your knee, and this is Giles, my little boy. Um, all that sort of power I, I had, you know, I, I just celebrated and, and absolutely loved. But sometimes, you know, quite often, even now, not long ago, I was walking in Oxford Street and a man stopped and he said, Tom Baker? And I said, yeah. And he said, Tom Baker, Christ. And I'm used to this. And I saw he was rather touched. He said, you know, and as he looked at me, I could see him being catapulted back somewhere. And he said, do you know, when I, he said, when I was a kid, I was in a home, you know, in North Wales and... Uh, and they didn't, it wasn't very good. They didn't like us, you know, nobody wanted us. And you made Saturday night good for us, you know? And I said, I could see his face. Well, and I, I went to speak, and he said, and squeezed my arm, and he was gone, you know? Now, to make a little speech to an old man in Oxford Street, 30-odd years later, showed, you know, the power, didn't it, of, of a benevolent character on Children's I remember the effect. I can remember at, at York University there was a student at that time they were all taking acid and uh, this person was having a really very nasty hallucinogenic episode and the person who was taking them around said, oh, and they realised what time it was on a Saturday night and in order to bring the person back down to earth they switched on the television and said, look, it's Tom, it's Doctor Who yeah. and all of a sudden the trip dissolved and that person came back down to reality again yeah, exactly. so your the effect that you could have but the episode i was talking about was that you were coming down the motorway and you stopped off and went to a house I did. do you remember I, there was a dispute because uh, uh mary whitehouse was criticizing us for being violent and didn't like me because i said the thing is i think we're not nearly being violent enough uh because we should be so violent that it becomes theatrical and funny um so I wanted to see this episode. So I, knock, I saw an old mini and a, some bicycles, and I knocked on this door, and a, a young man opened the door. And a split second, he said, yes. He looked at me, he said, Christ, Dr. Who. I said, listen, could I just watch the opening of a series? He said, come on in. And I crept into this room, and there were two little boys hugged, sitting next to each other, watching it on a telly. And I got on a chair like that. And, and he, stood, he stood there savoring this amazing little incident. And so anyway, it came up. Um, I saw the uh, I saw the incident of someone trying to drown me or something, and thought perhaps it wasn't all that good. But anyway, my s I was satisfied. I'd seen it like that, and I was watching these little boys. They were watching, and then the actors started talking about the plot, and the boys lost interest. Naturally, they did, uh, and they glanced over to and did an amazing double take, you know, uh, like Saint Bernadette at Su uh, you know at Lourdes. Oh. Uh, they couldn't believe it. Anyway, finally we got through. So it was absolutely wonderful. They were ecstatic to see me. And then instantly, it's very interesting, isn't it, when people are happy. When we are happy, we're instantly anxious about whether it would last or not. And they said, these little boys who were only about six and seven said, but when we get to school, they said, who will believe us? They won't believe us, Dad. And so they had to go next door and get a tape recorder, and I had to sign a declaration, you know, and, um, and all sorts of things like that to reassure them. And then, of course, as soon as I got back, we got in touch with the local press who went to their school, and it was a nice little article and everything like that. But that power of access, you know, to children, which is gone now, isn't it? Now you have situations of old men like me now are frightened of children. If you came out of a newsagent and there was a snotty little bugger falling off his bike, you or I wouldn't dare pick up such a child and console him, let alone say to two children outside of the outside of the shop, "Would you like an ice cream?" You know that has proved a nightmare situation. A friend of mine was talking to a friend of his accidentally outside a outside a, a primary school recently, and some hatchet-faced woman came out and said, "Would you two mind moving along, please?" They moved them along. You know, two 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 middle-aged men were talking outside a primary school. It's a kind of madness, isn't it, really? Talking about age, what what do you? I mean, you're still you're still working. You're rushing around. Only yesterday you were at some sci-fi yeah, conference. Yeah. You, uh, not, why don't you stop? Uh, could you stop working? Is it, do you well, keep I mean, working because you're bored? Or well, well, no, I'm not. You see, because I don't really talk. I don't really call 
this, you know, um, might be described as a job. It's not a job to me. It's actually being me. I, I have the opportunity to be me all the time and get a few laughs and, and keep the fear of death at bay. Uh, and th that's what happens when I go up to studios because everybody knows me. You know, I get there early and they get there early and, and, w and we have a laugh and everything. And often, quite often, um, I do uh, COD uh, answer phone messages for them. Um, and then I do. Uh, oh yes, because you made it, you made some money. Didn't there? there was some money in there, oh, yeah. wasn't there? Because you did. Because uh, I can the BT. Imagine. That's right. Yes, yeah. and, and, and people would ring up, and they would be able to. Uh, well, people could leave a message, and it was translated into my voice. That was very, very impressive technically. That, and so naturally, there were a lot of dirty phone calls going around, because I used to, uh, you know, a, a very common one was people would say to me, uh, you know, um, George and Edith, could you do our? our so I'd say. <coughs> Good evening. This is Tom Baker here. I'm taking the I'm taking the calls for George and Edith. So, if you've got an interesting message to say, to let us know. Speak after the tone, and if it's not interesting, just fuck off. So they used to think that was terribly funny. You know, it, it's a very old joke, isn't it? But it would work. You know, the idea they recognised my voice, and it gave George and Edith, you know, a few days of celebrity, and they got a lot more phone calls. They got the phone calls to be told to fuck off by Tom Baker, you know, and I was just obliging them, really. <laughs> we, we, you mentioned, you used the word, uh, you used the word death, um, and um, do we do we have any attitudes to death? I mean, uh, you were talking about Sabbath Theatre, which is a really great rage against uh, against dying, against yeah, yeah. the possibility of dying. Yes. Is it? A, is it? Do do you think about it? Do you yeah. monitor? Uh, every aspect of your physical health and think, right, this is it, or...? Yes, I, d I do uh, worry. My health is generally good. I'm rather arthritic, as you'd expect for someone nearly 77. But, uh, yeah, I do think about death a lot, and I, I really disapprove of it, quite honestly. I mean, I, <laughs> I look on it with a certain trepidation. I think, but it's the process, isn't it? It's the dying, not the death. You know, we all die. Uh, but uh, I think also... Uh, with my working class background, what horrifies me about dying is our vile system where old people now die, s you know, suppurating in their own excrement or die of hunger or die of neglect and things. Th that, those kind of humiliations. Uh, they used to say in Liverpool, you know, sometimes they say, you know, we're poor, you know, but we're clean. Alan Owen put that line in one of the Beatles films when George, George uh, Harrison kept saying, this is my granddad. He's very old, but he's very clean. He's very clean. It was funny, you, you've got nothing else except to be clean, you know? Dignity and... Uh, and I, l I would rather be dead, I think solemnly, I would rather be dead than lie neglected in a hospital ward in my own excrement. It's a terrible condemnation of our system that can happen. I used to be in the medical corps, you know? And I was only an orderly, highly trained orderly, for a brief uh, things about keep a, keeping people clean in bed, keeping beds without ruckle, no asses or getting bed sores. And we used to cruise the wards, you know, looking, hands in bed. You, that's all you go, someone's lying there, you put your hand in the bed, see, he was, he was dry. People were washed scrupulously. And uh, it's not easy look, looking, scraping uh, shit off people. But they're people, and you learn to love them, and you know what that means to people, you know? And I wrote about it in, in, in my book. I wrote about looking after someone who hated me and then became dependent upon me. But that's another sad story. Uh, there's actually a bond between good people, good nursing, that becomes a bond. Gerard Manley Hopkins wrote a, uh, a sonnet about it, Felix, Fa Felix Randall, the farrier, oh, he's dead then. There's a bond between the nurse and the, and, and the patient of one making life possible, bearable, full of dignity and gentleness. And so even old bodies or broken bodies can be something beautiful to handle and make better. Um, so my fear of death, that's, I'm sorry to go on about that, includes those anxieties, you know? The, of course, you, you must we all feel it, the dread of a sense of loss, you know, uh, the loss of our the loss of our youth, the loss of our hair, the loss of our libido, the loss of our... You know, when I see someone run upstairs now, sometimes it makes me want to... Curiously enough, I've talked to several old men uh, about this subject. I think uh, old people are very near to tears a lot of the time. I think. Um, 
because they're near to the great fright, aren't they? They're near to the... And so, therefore, when you see someone beautiful and young and clean and healthy, one is reminded of, of the old days now long gone, you know? Remembrance of things past. 